Hallelujah. 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 I've always found it very interesting when it comes to marriages. Especially on the day of the marriage, when the bride walks into the church. Oh, when I was in Melbourne, there we'd go through a process where um, we sit with a couple a few months before we take down all the details. There's, a lots of, there's lots of paperwork to be done when you're overseas and uh, uh, lots of government work to be done as well. So we go through a whole big process and that starts around six months, at least six months in advance. And so we sit with the, with the to-be bride and, and groom and uh, take down all the details. We understand how much they know about the faith. So it, it's, it's a kind of a, a long, lengthy uh, process. And when I was in the parish, it was interesting because uh, not many marriages take place. But when the ones that take place, you have to put in a lot of effort into it by talking to them, having those meetings with them. And then what interests me is the fact that on the day of the marriage, when the bride walks into the church, so often I look and I wonder, is this the same girl? Because of all the makeup that they do and the way they transform themselves, sometimes you look and you think, I'm sure this is not the one I've been speaking to. And then you start getting scared because you don't know who you're getting married now. You know, it's, your, um, it's, it's a legal... It's, it's, it's legally binding and so we cannot get the wrong people married. So it's always a thought. But you take any photograph or any video of, of the bride on her wedding day and she looks very different from what she normally looks. And then obviously after the wedding gets over, all the, all the makeup comes, comes off and they go back to reality. All the decorations all taken away. The church is considered as the bride of Christ. And a bride of Christ who Jesus himself adorns. Is not, is not a bride who gets adorned by, by a beauty parlor or anything else. A bride who is adorned by Christ himself. In Matthew chapter 16, in today's gospel, we read about the institution of the church itself, Jesus instituting the Catholic Church, when Jesus speaks to Peter and he tells him in verse 18 of Matthew 16, I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. You are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. It's important to understand that the words Peter and rock come from a single source in Aramaic called Kephas. And so Jesus is using a pun of words, intending one intention of the institution of the church. You are Peter and on this rock I will build my, I will build my church. Praise the Lord. So Jesus institutes the church in Matthew chapter 16. And the church comes alive when? He institutes the church in Matthew 16, but when does the church come alive? On the day of Pentecost, the church comes alive. It becomes a reality. What was in words when Jesus instituted it, now becomes a reality in Acts chapter 2, when the power of the Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles and from there the church comes alive. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But this relationship between Christ and the church is always a relationship of marriage. And so the, the, the marital relationship between Christ and the church is an ongoing marriage. When we have amongst a, a, a bride and a groom when you have the marriage after the day of marriage all the decorations are taken off the the makeup is taken off the the gown is taken off and marriage day is 
over. And then maybe, you know, many years later, you will turn back and you will look at the photographs and you will think, oh, did I look like this? So much has changed. But the relationship between Christ and the church, the marriage between Christ and the church is an ongoing process. Every day, Jesus is in a marital relationship and a marriage celebration with the church every day. And that is why the church is always called as the bride of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, we read about how um, a metaphor is used to understand Christian marriages in connection to the marriage between Christ and the, and the church. So what is the model given for Christian marriages? What is the model given for Christian marriages? What kind of marriages are you supposed to have? What kind of marriages are you supposed to have? Marriages like Christ has with the church. That is why the metaphor is used as as the background is always Christ's relationship with the church. So what kind of a relationship are we talking about? Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the, of the church. So in this relationship, Christ will always be the head of the church. The reason I am bringing this out to you is, today we have a lot of people who get very misled by what role the church plays. Why do I want to be a part of the church? Can I not just move away? Can I not just have my freedom? And this is where we need to understand our role within the church and how Christ sees the church as his bride and why we cannot detach ourselves from the bride of Christ. If we are detached from the bride of Christ, none of the relationships that Christ shares with his bride becomes a part of me. I'm detached from that marriage. So for the church, the church's head will always be Christ. As is said in verse 23, for just as Christ is the head of the church. So wherever the church is, wherever, whatever form the church is in, in different lands, still Christ will always remain the head of the, of the church. And where the head is, there the, there the body should be. You cannot detach the head from the, from the body and think that the body will be fine. So the church is always headed by Christ. It might have visible leaderships in the form of the hierarchy of the church. But the church is always led by, by Christ. And therefore, the moment I detach myself from the church, I have detached myself from Christ. We cannot have an existence in our Christian discipleship without being connected to Christ. There is no discipleship if there is no Christ. There is no discipleship if I'm not within the church because the church's head is Christ. As long as I'm a part of the church, I am in Christ. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we then as a church become subject to Christ. Verse 24, just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be. So that's the metaphor that's being used. But I'm taking the core of that teaching itself. Just as the church is subject to Christ. So what is the church always supposed to be? Always supposed to be subject to Christ. The moment I struggle to be subject to Christ and I want to go my own way is when I detach myself from the church. 
because I want my own thoughts, I want my own ideas, I want my own interpretations. I don't want anyone questioning me about my interpretations and about my understandings. So who is questioning? Who keeps us within the framework? Who keeps us within the framework? The head keeps us within the framework. It is only visualized in the hierarchy. But the head keeps us within the framework. That is why you see so many denominations. And even within denominations, you'll see a breakaway. Why? I want my interpretations and I want my freedom to interpret something. And so I detach myself instead of working within the bride of Christ. Is it easy to adorn a bride? Is it easy to adorn a bride? Is it easy to decorate and, and, and uh, um, get a bride ready for marriage? Yes or no? Yes or no? No, you work on it. It is never easy to prepare a bride. Now for the relationship between Christ and the church, the church is constantly a bride. Not just on one day. The church is constantly a bride. And so constantly the church is being prepared to be offered to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. And that is why every time we are subject to the, the head, we are being within the bride of Christ. We are being prepared for the head, for the groom who is Christ. So even if there is a desire for me to do something else, even if there is a desire for me to move away, even if there is a desire to work according to own, my own whims and fancies, I'm still living within the church because I know as long as I'm within the church, I'm still with Christ. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that is because Christ loves his bride. We read in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And what has he done? Gave himself up for the, for the church. He portrays his love by giving himself up for the church in order to make her holy. Verse 26. In order to make the church holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. So every day the church is being adorned, is being prepared by a cleansing through the word and the sacraments. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So understanding where we are in the church, who we are in the church and what is happening to us. Every day the Lord is preparing us within the church. Every day is our day of marriage. For the church, it is, it's a constant marriage that we are going through. So every day we are in a process of being beautified. The understandings within the church, the depths of the theology within the church, the depths of the interpretation of the scriptures within the church. Every day what is happening within the church is a preparation for marriage. The church doesn't become old. The church is not a bride of the past. The church is always the bride of the present. The church is always in preparation to receive the groom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jesus is constantly adorning his bride. So it is not anyone else who is preparing the bride. It is Jesus himself. Through the power of the word, he makes the church holy. And then the church is presented constantly. Verse 27. Verse 27. So as to present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Yes, so that she may be holy and blameless. So constantly the Lord is working on the, on the church to make it holy and blameless in his presence. So we go back every day. At the end of the day, the church begins the process again. 
at the start of the day the church begins the process again the lord is constantly making the church holy as unblemished now for us we might always think if the church is supposed to be unblemished then why is it that we see all these scandals in the church why is it that we see all the problems within the church well this is just a reality of who you and i are are you perfect are you perfect no praise the lord why will the church have its blemishes why will the church have its scandals because of us who makes up the church we make up the church so often we see the church as a different entity from us the church is wrong the hierarchy is wrong the priests are wrong the bishop is wrong the parishna is wrong so i want to move away from from this group so i see myself as being i'm detached from the church i am the church all of us together are the church if i have a blemish it means the church will have a a blemish if i have a fault the church will have a fault and that is what the lord is working on every every day he's working on me when he's working on me he's working on the on the church that is why we are being prepared every day but so often our mistake lies in the fact that we see ourselves being totally detached from the church i have nothing to do with that group that means i am perfect the others are imperfect when i acknowledge my imperfections i understand that i have to work within myself and i have to work within my family of the church in order to make it the bride that is presentable to christ praise the lord hallelujah and that is something that we do every day when you are at home do you like to clean your house every day at least more or less you know when when um i was in melbourne i was all by myself in the parish and uh, uh uh one of the things i liked was keeping things as they are N not because of anything else because i was just lazy to go and do work all together so if i was eating something i will stand at the at the kitchen table in 5 minutes i'll finish my my meal and then i will clean up that space because then i have to clean up only that much i don't have to clean up more when my sister and uh, my niece came visiting every time they would maybe drop something little i'll go and clean it up thinking that i have to clean up too much later together but that feeling that i need to i need to just clean it up my sister kind of said you're having ocd you know that's what you would kind of think well if you see my room you will never say i have any ocds about it because it's that dirty but um the the desire every moment i want to keep it i want to keep it clean every day you clean your homes every day we clean the church every day we go through that process of cleansing of the church that is how jesus is nourishing the church every day the church is not a finished product the church is on a journey so we cannot approach the church as a finished product we cannot look at the church and say oh there are faults it disturbs me it there will be faults we are human beings with human weaknesses but the lord is working on us and the greatest gift for the church is that the lord has not given up on the church the lord doesn't stop cleansing and nourishing the church we read in verse 29 for no one ever hates his own body but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it just as christ does for the church he nourishes it and tenderly cares for it just as christ does it for the church every day praise the lord hallelujah 
Hallelujah. So dear friends, you might see faults and mistakes within the church, but remember, the Lord is daily nourishing the church. We are all unique individuals and we are changing all the time. You are not the same person you were yesterday. What has happened? From yesterday, 8 o'clock in the morning, to now, 8 o'clock, what has happened? What change has taken place? What change has taken place in you? What change has taken place in you? No change has taken place in you. Yes or no? Yes? No? Yes? What change has taken place? Sorry? You know change has taken place, you don't know what change has taken place. Well, physically itself you have changed. You're now one day older. That one extra wrinkle has come up. That one extra white hair has come out. Physically, you're one day older. Emotionally, 24 hours has touched you in different ways. Different people you met and you saw, each person, how they looked at you has made an impact on you. How they spoke to you has made an impact on you. You're not supposed to be using your mobile phones, but if you were looking through the messages yesterday on your phone and you heard about something, emotionally what that has done to you, spiritually how much you have changed in 24 hours. We are people who are unique and we are constantly changing. So when we are constantly changing, it means the church also is constantly changing. And who is having to deal with that change? The Lord deals with that change. That is why every day He is nourishing us. Every day He is tenderly molding us. That is why we read when, when Jesus speaks to Peter in John chapter 21, Jesus asked Peter, do you? Do you love me? In what capacity is Jesus speaking to Peter? In what capacity is Jesus speaking to Peter? What does Jesus tell Peter in Matthew chapter 16? Peter, you are? Yes, you are the rock on which I will build my church. In that capacity, he is looking at Peter and he's asking him, Peter, do you? Do you love me? When Peter says, yes, I love you, what does the Lord tell Peter? You feed my sheep, tend my flock. Because if Peter does not love Jesus, it is impossible to feed and tend a flock like us. Where we are constantly changing. Where we are constantly turning up our behavioral and characteral patterns as well. Where we are constantly changing in our spiritual, with our spiritual requirements as well. Constantly the Lord is speaking to the church. Do you love me? Then feed this la these lambs and the sheep. In a constant moment of change that we are going through, we are constantly being prepared because every morning the bride has to be presented to Christ. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I don't know if you've seen a movie, don't ask me why I watched it, but uh, I don't know if you've seen a movie called 50 First Dates. Have you seen a movie like that? I watched it on a flight. Uh, 50 First Dates, it's about this, uh, this girl who has a short-term memory loss. So every day when she wakes up in the morning, everything that happened in her short term, she has forgotten. So she wakes up, and her boyfriend has to then teach her everything again, including loving her again. So he has to convince her that he is actually her, her boyfriend. So he writes things on the mirror and, and makes her write things on the mirror and everything. So every day in the morning, they have to go through that same process. Imagine if you had to do that for your spouse. Every day in the morning, 
start loving that man again hard enough isn't it and then you have to love him all over again and the next day again you have to love him all over again every day the church is presented as a bride to Christ every day it is going through a process it is very easy to walk out of the marriage that is what we do when we leave the church i walk out of a marriage the lord says i will never break my covenant with you there are so many who find it difficult to be a part of the bride of christ and we say you might not break the covenant but i will create another covenant there is no other covenant the lord has made with any other church but the covenant that was made with peter when he was said you are the rock on which i will build my church praise the lord hallelujah 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 don't create different marriages outside of this sacred marriage of the christ and the church you ask people especially overseas in western countries nowadays getting married a second time and a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time seems perfectly perfectly fine you ask them about it they don't feel guilty they now justify it and one of the reasons and one one of the reasons why they don't hold on to the faith is because it is easier to justify an immoral life when you don't have faith it is easier to do things according to your own whims and fancies when you don't have a moral law that is supposed to that is supposed to hold you back from sin and so even when they break away from a marriage it's so easy to say oh well that marriage was not meant for me the two of us were not meant for each other i just chose another person we are in a marital relationship with christ within the church i cannot walk out of this marriage praise the lord hallelujah hallelujah because the lord will not give up on us in second corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 St Paul is speaking to the Corinthian the the church in Corinth and saying I feel a divine jealousy for you for I promised you in marriage to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ but I'm afraid that you have fallen away and you have been misled But Saint Paul says I presented you as a chaste virgin but you have been misled but will the Lord give up on you no the Lord will continue to try to keep this marriage alive the Lord will continue within that marriage in Revelation chapter 19 Revelation chapter 19 verse 7 let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready to her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen bright and pure the 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 bride will be clothed in all her beauty even if sin comes our way the lord cleanses us he cleanses the bride and once again the bride is presented to the church and all that the bride is wearing on herself is in the form of the beautiful sacraments that we experience the power of the word that we experience whenever we partake of these sacraments we are being adorned as the bride of christ whenever i celebrate the eucharist i'm being adorned as the bride of christ in purity when i go for confession and i cleanse myself i'm being adorned as the bride of christ all the beauty with which the which which the church presents itself is presented through the sacraments when we baptize a child it is like the bride of christ is being beautified and that is why whenever i used to see 
way past, I used to speak about the sacraments over here. I used to say, when a baptism happens, it is important that the church community comes together. Sadly, nowadays, we become a very selfish set of people. We want only my child to be baptized. When the priest says there will be three or four other children, oh no, Father, we, can we have a private baptism? It's a selfish attitude that's not supposed to be within the church. The church is a community. Whatever we do as a church within a community, we cannot have private things. Private holy communions. Honestly, it's utter nonsense. Don't ever ask for it. It is a sin to do it. Because you are detaching yourself from a community. The celebration is that of the communities. Baptism is the church saying, here one more diamond is added to that beautiful gown of the church. The church celebrates it. Don't ask for private baptisms. Rather pray that the church community will be, be there to celebrate that moment. Because we are adorning the bride of Christ. You are preparing the bride of Christ. It is so important for us to understand every time when we stand in the confessional and the confession is made. You know, in the, in the past, when they had confessions, confessions was a rarity. It was not done very regularly. The church looked at confessions as if suppose my sister has sinned and her sin and the church considered themselves to be pure and holy so they would not sin they would try their level best not to sin if there is sin she is out of the community she is now in penance and she's waiting in penance and what is the church doing at that time the church is constantly praying for her because the church feels that the church is not yet complete one member of the community is out so it is not an individual's problem it is a community problem that is how the church always looked at the sacrament of of reconciliation it is not the person who is hurting it is the community that is hurting because the community is the bride just imagine the bride walking in and when she's walking in one part of her her gown tears do you think she'll be at peace do you think she'll be at peace no it disturbs her that one part even it could be a tiny little portion it is torn it disturbs her that is how the church even looks at the confessional very often we look at the confessional as an individual problem I committed a sin, so I need to go for confession. All the others are all saints and they are okay and fine. No, the church is hurting with you. The church is bleeding with you. The church is paining with you because the church cannot be without you. Without you, the church is empty. And that is why it's important. Every sacrament, when we are celebrating it, we are actually adorning this beautiful bride of Christ. When the word is proclaimed, we are adorning the church with the bride as the bride of Christ. When we are getting converted through the power of the word, the church is being adorned as the bride of Christ. With each sacrament, we are doing the same as well. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So don't look down on what the church is. The church is you and I, but we are constantly in a process. I would always say this. I found this as one of the best examples. You know Noah's Ark? Yes? Noah's Ark. What, what happened at that time? The floods were coming in. And what was being pushed into the ark? All the animals were being pushed into the ark, right? And then what happened? After that, what happened? Once the animals came in, they shut the doors and what happened? The floods came. How many days? 40 days and 40 nights. It was raining and there was floods. What do you think would have happened inside the ark? What do you think would have happened inside the ark? 40 days and 40 nights with all those animals. What do you think the animals would have done? 
they would have messed up the place wouldn't they now noah and his his family had two options they could either look at the mess and jump out of the ark and get drowned in the sea or they could remain within the ark and clean it up it's so easy to just walk away when we see blemishes within the church we work on it if i as a priest do see scandals within the church it's easy for me to say oh i don't want to be a part of this set i might as well go away it's easy to walk away but only cowards walk away only people who don't want to work on something walk away only people who want things on a platter work away only guests walk away family remains and cleans it up that is what the lord is calling us to do as well praise the lord hallelujah hallelujah go through that beautiful constant process of being adorned as a bride of christ every day it starts from you and from you it will spread but learn to appreciate the fact that the lord has never given up on the church praise the lord what does the lord say the gates of hades will never prevail against the church and for that we have a beautiful intercessor in the blessed mother she will journey with the church it's so beautiful and so significant that on the day jesus died on the cross he looked at john and he said behold your your mother and then he looked at at his mother and he said mother behold your what did he say mother behold your he said mother behold your praise the lord what did he say woman behold your son woman behold your son shouldn't he have actually said when he looked at john behold your mother and then looked at mama mary and said mother behold your son but what does he say woman behold your son in the scriptures whenever the lord has addressed mary as woman mary is in ministry there was one another time when he calls mary as woman when is that at cana there are so many people who so foolishly interpret this as jesus not giving too much of importance to mary what a terribly foolish interpretation to give at cana what was happening there was a situation with a family when the family is in dire straits what does mary come and tell jesus they have no wine and then jesus says woman what is it to you and me what is mary doing at that moment she is in ministry they have no wine she's coming and interceding she, they have no wine she is in ministry whenever mary is in ministry is when jesus has called her woman when he looks at john the beloved disciple who is the beloved the beloved is the bride the beloved is the bride looking at the bride he says woman here is your here is your son take care of my bride get them into my kingdom when we journey as a church we are never alone because the blessed mother is in constant ministry every moment she is interceding for the church he never let her motherhood die out it would have been a shame if such a beautiful motherhood died out but he never let her motherhood die out woman here is your son from now you will intercede for my beloved my bride and that is why she is called the mother of the church understand our catholic faith 
don't get taken up by silly interpretations that are emotional and give us a bit of emotional joy and happiness our faith goes deeper than emotions our faith touches our soul and our souls better be prepared one when it is time to enter into god's kingdom praise the lord